What's up, y'all? Welcome back to Purple Bear Biology. Professor Hurley here bringing you another cool episode over anatomy and physiology. In this episode, we're going to talk about our blood. More specifically, we're going to take a look at what makes up our blood and what the functions are of each of the important pieces of this cool red stuff. While the basic components of our blood are pretty straightforward, including things like red blood cells and white blood cells and even platelets, their functions are incredibly complex and cool. To take a closer look at the pieces that make up our blood, let's look at how we can first separate our blood to look at those pieces. Blood is actually a suspension of all sorts of really cool chemicals and cells, and to separate them we use densities of the different compounds and cells and a machine called a centrifuge. Essentially, you can think of this like one of those carnival rides that spin really, really fast and push all the blood to the top of your head. Except, in a centrifuge, things are separated by densities where the heaviest densities are on the bottom and the lighter objects are on top. When we separate blood like this, we find that it separates into three primary layers. A plasma layer that contains water and small solutes like sodium and chloride, as well as plasma proteins that will be incredibly important to osmotic balance between blood and our tissues. Collectively, this plasma layer accounts for about 55% of our overall blood concentration. Though realistically, this concentration can vary depending on how hydrated you are. The next layer is called the Buffy Coat. No, this is not the jacket of the famous vampire slayer. Instead, it's the layer that contains platelets, which are incredibly important for clotting, and leukocytes, which are actually your white blood cells that help protect your body from infection. The bottom layer is what contains cells called erythrocytes, but you probably know these little guys as red blood cells also called RBCs. The percentage of red blood cells found inside of your body by volume is called your hematocrit value. This is kind of like a measurement of how many red blood cells you have inside of your body at any given time. Higher hematocrits would signify that you have more red blood cells inside of your body, while lower hematocrits would signify that you have fewer of those little guys. Okay, so those are the basic pieces of our blood, but you may be curious where these components come from in the first place. Red blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells are all collectively referred to as formed elements inside of our blood, and they originate from stem cells inside of our red bone marrow. The process of forming red blood cells and white blood cells is referred to as hemopoiesis. Platelet formation is a little different, and we'll discuss that later when we discuss clotting. In addition to these formed elements, we have plasma proteins that free float in our blood and have a dynamic impact on whether or not water moves into our tissues or is actively moving moving into our blood. These little amino acid chains are really important for regulating blood volume and overall blood pressure, but we'll discuss more on that when we take a closer look at blood vessels in a couple videos. Overall, most of these plasma proteins come from our good old friend, the liver. With the parts and origins checked off on this adventure, have you ever wondered how much blood you actually have? Have you ever donated or had to have blood taken at the doctor's office? I know I have. When I was in the army, I remember them drawing blood, and after a couple vials, I began to wonder how much blood could they actually take from me. The good news is, is that you actually have quite a bit of blood in your body, around 5 liters. Now that is a lot of the red stuff, but we need this volume to ensure our bodies can regulate osmosis and transfer gases to all of our tissues. As a side note, if you've ever watched a med TV show or delved into medical terminology before, then you probably have heard of blood quantities in terms of units. One unit of blood is approximately one pint of blood. And then, of course, if you didn't know, there are about two pints per liter. So collectively, you have about 10 units of blood flowing through your veins at any given time. So what about my original fear? Could you give too much blood? In short, yes, you can but probably take way more than you think. Assuming you are in good health, have enough food in you, and are well hydrated, you can lose almost a unit and a half of blood before experiencing negative side effects. When you donate blood at a blood bank, they usually take about one unit in the session. This is why you can only donate blood once about every eight weeks. It just takes time for your body to build replacement components for the blood that is lost. However, with that said, those little blood vials that were taken from me in the army and used for other medical purposes hold far less blood. 
so you could donate dozens of those vials without resulting in low RBC counts. Alrighty, we have talked about the cool components that are found inside of that red stuff, but let's start to explore the functions of our blood for a bit. Now, there are a lot of functions of blood, so I tried to focus in on the big ones. The most well-known function of our blood is gas transport. Your red blood cells serve this primary function, picking up oxygen in your lungs and transporting it to the tissues where it gets used to make ATP. But of equal importance is their ability to carry carbon dioxide away from the tissues. So how do RBCs accomplish this vital function? Well, they are certainly built for the task. Red blood cells are a strange little cell that form the shape of a biconcave disc to maximize the amount of surface area they have exposed to the environment to maximize gas exchange. Additionally, these cells have lost any of the unnecessary components like a nucleus or mitochondria. Wait, what? Is that right? How do they copy themselves if they don't have these things? Well, they don't. A typical lifespan of a red blood cell is only about 120 days, after which they become kind of inflexible and most of them get trapped inside of the spleen and then broken down and the parts get recycled. So don't forget that new red blood cells come from stem cells, not existing red blood cells. Although they lack some of the things that we have come to expect in cells, one thing they do have a lot of is a protein complex called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a combination of four protein chains adhered together with an iron-containing molecule called a heme group at the center of each of the chains. The heme group is what allows the cells to bind gases for transport. Each one of our red blood cells has millions of hemoglobin complexes, making them gas-carrying machines. Another cool fact, have you ever heard that blood is blue when it's deoxygenated and travels through our veins? This is false. Our blood is never really blue, though we often depict vascular structures carrying deoxygenated blood as blue inside of diagrams to help distinguish where blood is going and where it has been. The myth probably also stems from the fact that if we look at our veins, they have a bluish color to them, but this is actually light being refracted through the different tissues and causes the color we see to change to blue. With that all said, Blood does come in different shades of red. Oxygenated blood found inside of our arteries tends to be a brighter red, while deoxygenated blood found inside of our veins looks darker in color. Now, in addition to RBCs carrying CO2 back to the lungs for us to exhale it away, our blood also has a buffer system called the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system that allows us to deal with any free-floating hydrogen ions that might accumulate due to things like acidic foods we eat. Additionally, accumulation of CO2 can cause the body's blood to become more acidic, a condition known as acidosis. pH changes in the blood negatively influence red blood cells' ability to transport gases, so this homeostatic set point is tightly regulated. Blood also serves as a superhighway for moving vital nutrients and ions around our body to the different tissues that need them, as well as carrying waste to be filtered out. Blood can even serve as a transportation system that white blood cells can use to monitor, investigate, and even eliminate potential pathogens. Check out this cool fact. Did you know that you have more than one type of white blood cell? Some release chemicals called granules that either attack pathogens or induce a more substantial immune response while others phagocytize pathogens by consuming them with their membranes and breaking them down. They even use parts of pathogens to tell other white blood cells what to look for. You can think of this kind of like a sketch artist does for the police. Blood also plays a pivotal role in blood pressure. Now, technically speaking, a lot of things influence blood pressure, but the pressure itself is a measurement of the pressure exerted on the arterial walls by our blood. So, if things like blood volume were to change, then the amount of pressure exhibited on the wall would change as well. As if all of those things were not awesome enough, your blood also helps you regulate body temperature. Blood can absorb heat from our body and allow us to move it around to the tissues. If we are overly hot, our body will direct more blood flow out to the surface capillaries of our skin, and this allows heat to radiate away from our bodies. 
Conversely, if we're overly cold, our bodies will constrain blood vessels, and this helps maintain our core body temperature for as long as possible. There are even some cool animals that have developed morphological adaptations that run arteries and veins right next to each other to accomplish a cool process called countercurrent heat exchange. This enables them to maintain their core body temperature even when their extremities are several degrees cooler. Check out a link in the description section for an overview on adaptations of circulatory systems if you're interested. The last major function of blood that we're going to discuss is clotting damage that occurs to our tissues. This is primarily to make sure we don't lose too much of that precious red stuff. Clotting itself is pretty cool and just a little bit complicated. So I'm going to make a video just for the topic and also the very important component of blood responsible for initiating this reaction called platelets. But to finish up this video, let's take a look at how our bodies can regulate the primary cellular component of our blood, the red blood cells. You may recall from our endocrine discussions that our kidneys produce a hormone called erythropoietin or EPO. Your kidneys are already doing an amazing job of helping filter and regulate blood osmolarity, but they also have special cells that enable them to monitor oxygen concentrations in the blood too. If those oxygen concentrations drop, then the kidneys release the hormone, EPO, that travels to our bone marrow and stimulates red blood cell production. From the kidney's perspective, more red blood cells mean more oxygen carriers, and thus this should enable O2 levels to rise inside of our blood. But what happens if our RBC numbers are out of whack? What we are really discussing are blood disorders like low red blood cell counts called anemia, or high red blood cell counts called polycythemia. Typically, we can identify these conditions by taking a look at a patient's hematocrit level. Recall from the beginning of the video that hematocrit values are a way to measure concentrations of RBCs in our blood. These values actually vary between males and females, with females typically having lower hematocrit values overall. Anemia, or low hematocrit values, can have lots of different causes, but tend to result from either the inability or slowed ability to make red blood cells. Additionally, genetic variables can influence RBC survival. Deficiencies in nutrients tend to be the most common way that we can encounter anemia, with iron deficiency being at the top of the list. Without iron, the heme group in hemoglobin cannot be built, and thus leads to a reduction in cell production. Of course, there are other conditions that are more related to genetics than environment. Sickle cell anemia is a good example. In this condition, there is a genetic mutation that causes hemoglobin proteins to clump together inside of the cells, making the cells take on a more sickle shape. These misshapen cells tend to clump together, get stuck in smaller capillaries, and even broken down in the spleen more rapidly than they would have otherwise. The result overall is a multifaceted disease but one of the primary outcomes is a reduction in red blood cell numbers. Of course, hematocrit values can be too high as well. This condition is referred to as polycythemia. It too can result from genetic predispositions for certain disorders or even environmental variables like smoke inhalation from cigarettes and even where you live on the planet. You heard me right. Where you live influences your hematocrit level, and here is how. We tend to think of air as just being air, no matter where we're at. However, if you've ever traveled to high altitude, you'll notice that just going for a walk can be exhausting. But why? Well, at high altitude, there is less pressure on the air around us. And less pressure means that the gases inside of the air can spread out and become less densely packed. This means that at high altitude, a single breath of air will contain less oxygen than a single breath of air at lower altitudes. Of course, the body will respond to less oxygen by producing more EPO, thus raising red blood cell numbers to ensure we still collect enough oxygen to keep the ATP production 
operating. Even more remarkable is that if you move from a lower elevation to a higher one, your body will physiologically adapt to the new altitude by raising your hematocrit. This type of physiological change is referred to as acclimation and is vitally important for individuals like mountain climbers who have to travel to higher altitudes in stages. It also is why athletes in endurance sports have been known to train at higher altitudes and then compete at lower ones. This type of altitude training can have a significant impact on athletic performance, so much so that some athletes have been caught cheating the system by getting blood transfusions from individuals with higher hematocrit levels through a process called blood doping. There are even some products that advertise giving you the same benefit of high altitude training without the costs of the travel. I should mention that these types of oxygen reduction masks could be effective, but would require you to wear them almost all of the time. If you only wore them while working out, you're more likely to just to deprive your body of oxygen rather than giving your body time to adapt to the less oxygen that you're taking in. Well, that's it for this episode of Purple Bear Biology. I hope you all found some of the information interesting and helpful. If you liked the video, be sure to click the like button and subscribe to the channel. If you found the video helpful, consider sharing it with others that may use it too. If you have any questions or comments, drop them in the comment section below. And as always, thank you all for watching and see you all next time.